Today we're at Gerard's Cross in Buckinghamshire and we're here to investigate the hidden house history of this crenellated creature. I'm Jonathan Foyle and I'll be grappling with the architecture. I'm Nick Barrett and I'll be looking for original documents to find out who lived in a house like this. Yeah, tell you what we do know, the current owner's called Angela. Let's go and meet her, shall we? Well, there's windows up there. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. As Jonathan said, this stylish period house boasts some decorative features that wouldn't be out of place on the battlements of a castle. It certainly looks impressive from the front, but is there more to this place than meets the eye? In today's programme, Jonathan hunts for the oldest part of the house and gets his hands on some unusual wood panelling. And Nick attempts to put some names to faces from the past. Oh, this is absolutely stunning. The present owner, Angela Windsor, moved here with her family in 1991, together with one or two pets. She's been told that the house was built in three stages, and she wants the Hidden House History team to help her find out which is the original part. So there's three parts, barn, cottage, and then house, house. added on. So yep. it's like an early barn conversion in a way. <laughs> Very much so. And she's also got something juicy for Nick to get his teeth into. I do have a picture that I found in the attic of bits of the house, and there's a lady standing by the well in long attire, and then there's a photocopy of a deed, and it's got some dates and things on it. The photograph really intrigues me, because it's so rare to get the glimpse of potentially someone who would have lived in this yeah. house. I think it must sound Could those documents and photographs reveal who once owned this house? And what about that rather overstated architectural feature in the front hallway? This is the wood panelling I was telling you about, which I think is probably South American rather than European. Well, I don't, but my carpenter did. It's busy, isn't it? It is busy, and it's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't like these fellas greeting you every time you walk in the front door? They're very gargoyles. <laughs> so, Angela wants to know how old her house is, who are the people in the photographs, and where does the wood panelling in the hallway come from? How will Nick and Jonathan kick off their investigation? So what do you think then, Maestro? <laughs> I'm glad I'm not in your shoes. That place is an absolute maze in there. And it's, it's about five times bigger than it looks when you arrive, isn't it? Yeah. She's talking about three phases. I've got a date then. Angela mentioned she's got some documents and also photographs. Now that's great. I love look, working with old photographs because mm. it gives you a face, a personality to put back inside the house. So that's where I'm going to start. OK, right. Well, let's get that tea she promised, shall okay. we? Personality of the house, perhaps. But what about the character of the area? It was thanks to the arrival of the railway in 1906 that Gerrard's Cross established itself as a wealthy commuter town within easy reach of London. One of the area's biggest country estates that was redeveloped at the time was the Orchill Estate. That's where Angela's house stands. In fact, it's but a stone's throw from the original manor, Orchill House, now a rather upmarket girls' school. Angela's house itself looks quite grand, but Jonathan is not easily swayed by first impressions. Gerard's Cross is full of big houses built by people who wanted to pretend they'd inherited a bit of old England. This one is sort of Elizabethan, so you've got the crow step gables up there, one step going up to the next in quite expensive cut stone, and the windows that stick out too are Elizabethan in character. So this to me looks like a late 19th century building, that's pretending to be Elizabethan. And it's pretty much all of one style where you enter. But it doesn't mean it's the same round the back. That's where the real history of this building could lie. A mock Elizabethan manor built around the end of the 19th century. And Angela's been told that there are three different stages to its construction. Jonathan wants to see the evidence for himself to try and date the oldest part. Right, so facades are what you're supposed to see, but tucked around the sides and the back is the business end so often for me because this is where people spend least of their money showing off. This is where the building stands the best chance of being unrestored. And it's where you see junctions in the fabric like that. You can see that Victorian part there in the dark red brick meets 
Is it older? Well, let's, let's work it out. It's got an orangey brick and it's got round windows we're seeing for the first time. There's one there and one further on, so we've got a pair of them. And those round windows I've seen in Georgian buildings. They love those simple geometries. To me, that's an 18th century uh, piece of building, older than what I first saw. Well, what about this? White rendered block. Could it be a third phase, even older? Are we going back in time? Well, what you can say is that this big arch here or opening is not meant for human habitation. It's supposed to be a barn or a stable. It's an agricultural building. So it looks like three sections, one for livestock or agricultural use, then a farm worker's cottage, and then the main house. But all is not as it seems. Well, look closely, because this is where the magic of the details come in. Because above the barn, that brick detail there at the eaves carries on right the way across this part with the domestic looking windows. What I think we've got here is one consistent older Georgian piece of agricultural building and a pretty fine one too. It's two buildings then, not three as Angela thought. The Georgian farm workers cottage and barn are one part, the fake Elizabethan house the other. But is it that simple? Jonathan will have to do his homework and get it down on paper to see how it all fits together. Here. That's them there. And Angela's Look. turned out her attic to show Nick those documents and photos. Oh my goodness. What, if anything, do they reveal about the previous stunning. occupants of the house? And we've got a lady sitting by a well. Which is the well at the front. So we can actually cite that. Mm -hmm. And a boy pushing a wheelbarrow. I don't know where that greenhouse was in relation, I suppose. Mm. Well, that's interesting that it's disappeared completely yep. from the house's site. Mm. So maybe that will help mm. date not just the house, but also the, this photograph in its own right. Little clues like that, things that disappear, can help when you are trying to date photographs. That's why I love working with them. Nick needs to get behind that frame, and he persuades Angela to let him get his hands on the actual documents. Aha, uh -huh. look at this. I think this is a photocopy of what looks like a conveyance, part of a title deed package. Now, let's have a look. This indenture, so it's an agreement between the parties, made the 25th date of September 1912 between William Gurney, who lives in Amersham, which that's the first name we've got, and Marie de Cant of Hampton Lodge, Gerard's Cross. So she clearly either owns or occupies Hampton Lodge in 1912. So that's the first really important piece of evidence that we've got. Right. I just wonder whether she has got anything to do with, with this that. title deed. Yep. I wonder whether that is Marie de Cant. So now Nick has some names that seem to tie in with the selling off of Hampton Lodge from the Archill estate. Even better than that are the photos, faces from the past that may even bear one of those names, Marie de Cant. Could this be her? Jonathan's been busy too using his trusty tape measure and pencils to help him peel back those mock features and get to the real Georgian heart of Angela's house. It's all in the proportions. Now, every complex building looks like a real challenge when you, when you turn up and wander through a maze of rooms, but get it down on paper, on 2D. If you've got a building that was developed in two or three stages, it might have two or three different sets of proportions. The proportions on paper confirm what Jonathan found in the brickwork earlier. The old barn and farm workers' cottage are evenly divided for livestock and for man. And these even proportions continue with those arched windows. And if you look at those and measure them closely, you can see that they are six feet wide. They're four feet tall. The door is seven feet high and three feet wide. You've got simple one foot units. And so even though this is an agricultural building, there's a very nice sense of proportion that runs through it. And that's different to everything that was added on. Angela, come and have a look at this. Nick's been searching the census records online and is beginning to unravel the mystery of the woman named in that document which Angela found in the attic. I've got a couple of gems for you. Both of them relate to Marie de Cant. The yeah. first dating from 1871. Here we have Marie 
Decant, mm -hmm. aged four. She's the daughter of a Mary Ann Decant and Henri Decant, who, if we scroll across, was born in France, oh. hence the rather unusual surname. Now, his occupation was dividends. Now, dividends could mean stocks and shares. So clearly, they are people of some substance, a lot of money. Now, the other match is actually 30 years later, very close to the date on your documents. And if we have a look on the 1901 census, it looks like there's been a bit of a sadness in the family. Henri is no longer with her. Marianne is listed as a widow. And Marie de Cant is living with her, aged 34. Okay. So she's still single. Now Angela's beginning to be intrigued by her predecessor and has one or two theories of her own. In her time, she must have been fairly sort of avant-garde because to come and live in a house like this on your own in an obviously male-dominated society as it was at the time, you know, you must have been quite a, quite a strong character to have done that. Just a couple of hours searching on the internet and Nick is already putting flesh on the bones of this woman, Marie de Cant. It's amazing how easy it is to find information about your house online. Census records can now be downloaded straight into your own house. While you can find out about maps, plans and other surveys by scouring the net. It's very easy and you can do it from the click of a mouse in the comfort of your own home. Still to come on Hidden House History, Jonathan gets to the grain of that wood panelling and Nick's hopes for identifying the woman in the photo suffer a setback. OK, that's given me a huge problem. <laughs> <laughs> In today's Hidden House History, Jonathan and Nick are investigating a mock Elizabethan manor in Gerrard's Cross, Buckinghamshire. And if you look there, there's... Nick's found out that one of the previous owners was called Marie de Cant, and she lived here in the first half of the 20th century. Could she be the woman in the photograph? And Jonathan's convinced that there are two key phases of building, an 18th century Georgian back and a 19th century mock Elizabethan front. But what about the wood panelling in the entrance hall? Is its past as exotic as Angela hopes? Something about it doesn't quite fit, and it's roused Jonathan's curiosity. Now, the question for me is, was this joinery always in this room? Was it designed for the room? Or might it have come from somewhere else and was recycled and reused to fit the space? Well, have a look at the, the, the corners. Again, the magic's in the details. You see that fat board here of oak in the middle? That's one hand span, okay? I'm keeping that dimension there. I'm carrying it to the far side of the room. And this one is a couple of inches broader. And, have a look at this, you see the original joinery in this room is overlapped by the panel. The poor fit of the wood panelling convinces Jonathan that it's a later addition. But he's no nearer to discovering what the type of wood is or where it came from. Nick, on the other hand, has been bolstered by what he's discovered from the census. Now he wants to find evidence that'll prove the woman in the photograph is indeed Marie de Cant, who lived here in 1912. He's called in Sophie bougeot labrune an expert in dating period garments and costumes. Can she confirm what he hopes? What would you say, or how old would you say this photograph is, just simply from the style of clothing? Mm. It looks to me around 1900s. 
because of the high neck on the blouse. Okay. Um, the sleeve head is quite voluminous, quite large. At the top here, yeah. Yes, and you can vaguely see a bit of a pigeon chest, which is classic of the 1900s. Right. If this is Marie de Cant, mm. the earliest she could have been in our house here is 1912. Um, bit of a setback for Nick then. This woman's clothes seem to be turn of the century, over a decade too early to link her to Marie de Cant and the date in the deeds of 1912. He'll have to try a different approach. Right. Jonathan wants to pinpoint the source of that wood panelling. So he's asked tree specialist Paul Sharphouse for his expert opinion. He should be able to separate the wood from the trees. While Jonathan leaves Paul to put the timber to the test, Nick is on a quest. He's heard about an exhibition.